If I had, you'd never have slipped into that trance and we'd never have learned about the mass. Before all of this, I was your normal college frat guy. I won't beat around the bush about it. I was an asshole, as were all my friends. That's why, when walking back to our hotel from the last spring break party we'd ever attend, we decided to break into the museum. It was our idea of a harmless prank. It wasn't some big science museum like the Smithsonian, you understand. It was a small two-story building housing various artifacts of importance to the locals. It was a time capsule containing all the memories of when this beachside settlement was still known for the prize sea bash fishermen caught, as opposed to the drunk partygoers. Our selfish plan, which I am not at all proud of, was to go in, strip the wax figures in the exhibits down to the nude, then pose them in, um, compromising positions. We could barely contain our drunk giggling as we searched in the dark for an entranceway at the rear of the building. There were four of us. Me, Larry, Ethan, and Jeff. It didn't take long for one of us to jimmy the rusted lock on the back door and slip inside. At the time, I was glad the museum wasn't rigged with an alarm system. These days, I wish it had been. If it had, the four of us would have been apprehended before we started poking around the unlit exhibits. It was Jeff who found the storage room, behind an imposing diorama of some local men fighting off a large sea creature out in the ocean, was a trap door. It was made of the same sun-bleached beech wood the rest of the ground floor was decked with. The dozen or so hinges on one side were small, almost hidden. The thin seam that ran between the hatch and the rest of the flooring bordered on invisible. If Jeff hadn't tripped on an errant harpoon Ethan had displaced, he might have never noticed it. As it was, the rest of us stopped when we heard his voice drift up from the floor. Guys, there's a basement. Of course we went down there. It took us all of five minutes to repurpose a 19th century fisherman's knife into a trapdoor unwedging tool. The four foot by four foot square of beech wood didn't have a handle that we could find, nor a keyhole to suggest we needed to search for keys. It swung open without creak or protest, almost like the forgotten and often ignored museum wanted us four loud, brash, obnoxious spring breakers to venture into its depths. Cell phone flashlights flared into life one by one as we each reached the cool air at the foot of the ladder. The windows kept the dusty ground floor bathed in moonlight, but the space below was pitch black. It was a landing of sorts, a square concrete space with no light fixtures that we could see. A quick scan with the four flashlight beams showed us the room's only feature almost instantly, a door on the opposite wall. The bold black font on the yellow plastic sign meant we didn't have to guess the room beyond its purpose. Storage. Management only. We were four drunk frat boys on spring break. Four drunk frat boys who could already be booked for a string of offenses for vandalism, to breaking and entering, to being drunk and disorderly. What else were we supposed to see the words management only as other than a challenge? Jeff had discovered the hatch to the basement, but it was I who opened the door marked management only. Larry, Ethan, and Jeff were on tiptoes over my shoulder whooping and hollering excitedly as I delivered a kick after kick to the locked door handle. The inebriated ruckus stopped the moment the wood around the lock splintered. The door swung inwards. A bony face leered down at me. I screamed, stumbling backwards and falling flat on my ass. The other three were howling with laughter. I looked up, anger replacing the fear of my throat. The pallid teeth and empty sockets belonged to a human skeleton, one of the kind scholars in the olden days used to study anatomy. The grinning skull seemed to laugh along with my friends from its glass case as I pulled myself to my feet, swearing under my breath. Very funny, I snapped as we walked past the silently guffawing skeleton into the forbidden storage room. My friends continued chuckling as we made our way deeper into the inky blackness. However, the more we browsed the management-only artifacts with the beams from our cell phones, the quieter their intoxicated tittering became. The museum of local history on the floor above had been unsettling, but it was the kind of uncanny valley unsettling you get with badly crafted waxwork sculptures 
bleak paintings of grey stormy seas, and painful looking implements from history. The unsettling that comes from trespassing in the dark in a space never meant for viewing with the lights out. A normal kind of unsettling. The hidden exhibits revealed by the flashlights in our phones were a different kind of unsettling entirely. Larry noticed the first one. It was a painting. I'm no expert in art history, so I can't tell you from what era the artist belonged to. From the clothing of the foaming mouth figures depicted, it couldn't have been painted more recently than at the turn of the 19th century. We gazed at it together for a while, not saying much. The eight men and women on the canvas had been painted so vividly they looked more as though they'd been captured by shutter and lens than by oil and brush. That's what made the expressions on their faces so frightening. Each pair of eyes were bulging, protruding so far that veins and muscles were clearly visible where eyelids should have been. Their snarling lips peeled back tightly so that every crack and frothing crevice in the gums around their yellow teeth could be seen. Eight snarling, ravenous faces dancing around a pile of flaming logs at the base of a wooden pole. A pole that had a crying child tied to the top, dangling mere feet from the flames. That wasn't what made the lump catch in my throat, though. Not initially, at least. No. What first made me start to consider the possibility I was somewhere very wrong was the building the mad dancers were making their sacrifice in front of. It was our hotel. Our many times since refurbished, but still very much rustic and true to the town's roots, hotel. The painting didn't have a title or a frame. It hung on a rusted nail and dirty string from the cinder block walls. After a few minutes, one of us shuddered and suggested we move on. Unfortunately, the rest of the exhibits only gave the growing tightness in my chest for the cause to take hold. The lump in my throat grew heavier with each illuminated exhibit, the spaces between breaths shorter and shorter with every new oddity the museum management kept hidden down here, away from minds too weak to comprehend them. There were taxidermied creatures none amongst us recognized, stuffed things with forms completely unfamiliar, a menagerie of twisted beings with no tangible adherence to the laws of nature or biology. There was a school of six dried fish, each sporting three pairs of inch-long human arms hung on wire from a thin pipe scaffold. There was what I could only describe as an orangutan with matted dark fur, no head, and a large mouth where its belly should be, locked forever in a duel with a rhino-sized frog on a large wooden plinth. Most shocking of all was the large, dried-out husk of a bus-sized maggot with the face of a colossal human baby hanging from the ceiling by thick cables screwed into somewhere unseen on its back. We found dioramas and paintings of horrific acts and incidents, the details so clear they could only have been recreated from a memory. There were shelves of dusty books, volumes bound in I don't want to know what, Books with titles like Ha Ha Ha, The Children Are Bleeding, A Housewife's Tale, and The Sanctity of Silence. Scattered amongst the painting shells and grotesque anatomies were glass cases containing tools and implements whose designs seemed far too intricate and advanced to carry the level of rust and corrosion they did. Despite the fresh wave of dread that came with every new monstrosity we pressed on, trying and failing to convince both each other and ourselves that none of them were real. It's just some leftover stuff from some stupid art project. Look, you can see on that one. It's obviously made of rubber, right? Whoever made this stuff was a real twisted guy. Probably some sick kind of basement dweller. These comments and many more did nothing to stem the rising panic in what forced nervous laughs remain. We'd been stupidly traumatizing ourselves in the crushing darkness for half an hour before I found it. A mask, laying alone on a plinth a full six feet away from any of the other nightmarish exhibits. I spotted it first. I wish that hadn't been the case. 
If one of the others had been the first to unearth it in the dark with the glare of their phone light, maybe they would have been the idiot that put it on. It was completely blank, save for half a dozen or so angular symbols carved thumb deep into its surface. There were no eye, nose, or mouth holes, no gaps with which the wearer could see or breathe. It was made of a metal I didn't recognize, a dark and bluish mottled substance that reflected the light from my phone back at me as a heady mix of purples, oranges, and greens, almost like an oil slick. Its strangest qualities are more difficult to put into words. I can't quite phrase it right, but it knew I was looking at it. It was happy. It wanted to be found, and in a way I can't explain, it let me know that very clearly. It called to me, communicating with subconscious suggestions that this was the one time where you should touch the exhibit. I was already holding the thing in my hands before Larry or Jeff or Ethan yelled something in my direction through the haze. Even though the air this far into the moss limb of unutterable things was freezing, the mask was warm to the touch. Its pearlescent metal surface soothed my fingertips, inviting me to feel its bliss-inducing heat on my face. I just about registered a hand on my shoulder when the mask's velvet interior sucked into my waiting, smiling features. Instantly, I knew I'd fucked up. When my eyes opened, I wasn't in the storage room. I wasn't anywhere. I was floating in a void, surrounded by nothing but endless blackness. No, not floating. Falling. There was no air, but the emptiness rippled and skimmed my face as I plummeted. All around me was pitch black. Yet as I strained, I realized to my growing horror that there were shades and tones to that absolute nothingness, despite the fact that this is utterly impossible. Streaks of the dark shadows that concealed monsters under children's beds, patches of moonless nights with which unspeakable things prowl, ghosts of the unknowable darkness that sits in the hearts of evil men. All of these shades of nothing and more danced and writhed around me while I tumbled, the friction that shouldn't exist in a vacuum ripping my skin raw. I'd been falling in a soundless scream for what felt like days when something slammed into my chest knocking the wind out of me. Thump. The smell of sea air and fresh brine pierced my nostrils. I could hear men grunting and shouting from every direction, roaring to be heard over the waves. There was a solid floor beneath me, Wood that was wet and cold and smelled of dead things pulled from the depths. I'd been in the multi-toned darkness so long that it took me a few moments to register that my vision was returning. I stood, still screaming. My skin was still being whipped raw, but now the lashing came from freezing rain-filled Atlantic winds. I was on a ship, the same fishing vessel from the diorama in front of the trap door in the museum. The fishermen were there too. They were staring at me, each stopping whatever important task they were doing to gawp at the sudden stranger in their midst. They didn't have time to gawp long. One of them yelled, pointing at something behind me. I turned around, the screams knocked from my horrified lungs by a fresh, inexpressible terror. The thick tentacle of the ocean monstrosity in the diorama crashed through the ridging above my head. Splinters and shards peppered the rain as I fell to my knees, wailing at the sight of those sewer plate-sized stickers lined with obviously human teeth. I was rooted, paralyzed with fear as the squid-like appendage as thick as a train tunnel fell upon me. I closed my eyes, the smell and warmth of its flesh inches away from my face. Then I was falling again. The salty tang and raw of the waves was replaced with the sting of rushing darkness. Thump. The wind was once more knocked from me. This time I could smell smoke, hear a child crying. I was in the painting Larry had found. The warmth of the fire licked my tear-stained face as I backed slowly away from the rabid dancers leaping towards me. Their whooping and hollering, screaming in a dated but recognizable dialect about my coming being a sign from the old gods. One manages to grab my arm and bite down, leaving a scar I can still feel, but can't yet bring myself to look at. I turned to run, 
bumping into a sullen old man clutching a canvas, brushes, and some paints. Thump. I'm stood in a field. A crowd of indigenous-looking people stop skinning the headless orangutan thing they've killed and stand and point in my direction, reaching for their spears and axes. Before they can split my skull, there's a deafening ribbit. A frog the size of a rhinoceros leaps from the rushes. It lands on one of the natives. There's a loud crack on the wind as their spine breaks. Before either his kin or myself could react, I am knocked to the ground by a sticky amphibious tongue with a tip the size of my face. I am wrenched from the ground, my fingernails filling with dirt as I scramble to pull myself away from the beast's waiting maw. Thump. I am standing alone on a plain. Wild horses stampede around me, braying and snarling in panic. I turn around to see that they are being chased by a living version of the baby-faced maggot husk from the museum. Spindly arms that must have rotted off, snatching up whole horses to stuff in its gaping, toothless mouth. Its glassy, lifeless eyes lock on mine, and somewhere in the back of my skull, I feel its sudden curiosity at the new thing before it. Thump. Knee-high, prehistoric reptiles scamper at my feet. They stop building a waist-high obelisk and put down their miniature tools to observe me conversing in a language of syllables and vowels impossible to replicate with the human tongue. Thump. Sulfur and ash clog my lungs. I can hear nothing but the roar of primordial tectonic fury. The sky is dark and red. Before my eyes are blinded by a layer of soot, I catch sights of a horizon of volcanoes and firestorms. Thump. I am in space. A spiraling cloud of dust and debris stretches around me. From somewhere in the distance, the faint light of our infant star covers my choking form in a faint orange glow. Thump. I am sitting in a chair. There's a glaring sun over me, although it's not my own. I wince from its brightness, straining to take in my surroundings. The chair is on a completely flat metal surface that glistens with the same pearlescent shimmer as the mask. This flat plane stretches all around me, in all directions, until it reaches a large wall of the same material, thousands of miles in the distance and taller than any building the hands of man could construct. The bindings and chair are like nothing I recognize. They are at once both organic-seeming and flexible, yet apparently forged from the same rigid metallic substance as the ground. I don't have long to try and understand this contradiction, however. The booming voice from the stars beyond this alien sun made sure of that. Ah, good. We wondered when your kind would be ready. The power of it knocked what little breath remained from my lungs. I felt my eardrums burst. That's how I know I can't hide in the false comfort of convincing myself this never happened. I could never have imagined or conceived the owner of that atom-rattling voice, and even if I could, a voice in my head couldn't leave me permanently deaf. The end of the first sentence was enough to make sure I'd never hear anything again. The rumbling and buzzing in my every fiber let me know it was still conversing as I looked up. Ears bleeding and let out a scream I could no longer hear that I don't think stopped for several days. The alien sun wasn't a sun, it was a bowl. A planet-sized bulb hanging from wires as thick as Jupiter's red spot in diameter. The flat metal plane I was on wasn't an empty landscape, it was a petri dish. The real horror came when I worked out the true meaning of the shifting constellations in the sky above. The stars beyond the colossal bulb above the dish weren't stars at all. They were reflections. Reflections in the trillions of eyes of the galaxy-sized being peering down at my impossibly tiny, insignificant form. Its scale was so vast that I could not make out any details beyond those eyes. As an insurmountable number of pupils the size of stars blinked and drilled into me from the gaping, no longer emptiness of space above, even craning my neck to look directly up, I could not see the full extent of its form. So colossal was this being, 
that the twinkling reflections from the furthest of its eyes would have taken eons to reach the spot where I strained and fought against my bindings. The stellar gulfs between eyes were smoky and gaseous, yet I knew that beyond those plumes large enough to swallow the Milky Way, a vast cosmic anatomy lay hidden. At the great rim of the dish on which it studied me, its form spread into a nexus of thin tendrils. These magnitudinally impossible to measure swarms of ancient limbs ballooned and stretched outwards, forming thick, oily clouds that convulsed across the steel tundra. The rupturing buzz from the being beyond all reason didn't stop as one of these fogs snaked towards me. Its tip was the size of a continent. I could feel the gravitational pull from it as it got closer, the sheer force threatening to rip me from the living metal chair. I was still screaming when my eyes rolled back in my skull, the experience finally too much for my mind to take without shutting off. Thump. I was in the basement of the museum. Larry, Jeff, and Ethan were standing above me. They were shaking me, saying something. I couldn't hear them. I couldn't hear anything but a shrill ringing that drowned out all other sounds. It didn't matter to me anyway. I ran both from the storage room and from them, but not before bending over to puke for a good twenty minutes. I was shaking, crying. I could feel via the tearing in my throat that my screaming hadn't stopped. I never saw any of them after that night. I cut off all ties. Didn't even message them to explain why. They could have got curious and tried on the masks themselves for all I know. I ran straight back to the hotel covered in tears, grabbed my bags and left. Sank everything I had into the first ticket back home. Not college home either. Home home. I dropped out of school and moved back in with my parents. I can't look at photos of that time of my life. Not without breaking down into a quivering mess. Even with heavy medication, the slightest reminder is enough for me to write off the rest of the day. Or at least it was. I've been getting better with the sign language, so I've gained back a little confidence. Enough to face writing down everything for the first time, to actually try to relive the memory and piece together what I saw. You probably wouldn't guess from the length, but this has taken me about five months to get down. I've had to stop multiple times and once even had to check back into a psych unit for a few days. It's been worth it though, looking back. It's out of my system now. That's the first step, right? Now I can go about the task of taking my therapist's advice and try to pretend it didn't happen. That's not her words for it, but they're mine. I know what happened. This wasn't a drunken memory distorted by a psychotic break. I remember all of it far too clearly. Plus, if it's a false memory, why did a mask-shaped package wrapped tightly in a crumpled canvas painting of madmen dancing around a pyre arrive on my doorstep this morning?